Thank you, Administrator Sweet, and thank you for your testimony. I want to start with your talking about the senior uh, contracting positions within the government. One thing very appreciative that the President has done is elevated your position to a cabinet level position. So you get to look your peers in the eyes and say, why haven't you met this 5% goal? Um, what do you think it takes? Um, obviously, we're going to pursue a sole source contract position, but what you outlined a few things, if you could expound on these senior contract officials that you think would help this process. Um, one is just uh, it, thank you for pointing out that the president elevated this position. So I now do sit at the table across from DOD and DOE and, and, uh, and uh, every other department, and we have collegial conversations about this. But what I want to tell you is, again, from the top, when the president says that this is a priority, it heralds all the way through the agency. So today, my buying officers at key buying activity centers are waging you know, their voice and speaking up loudly, very ardently. And we have challenged, we've already challenged many instances where we think that the opportunity could have gone to a small business. Uh, we need to continue to make certain that our business counseling centers, when I talk about smarter systems, uh, Senator, I also think that it's important for us to make sure that the counseling programs are systematized so that uh, women can understand how to go about the process. The other point that I'm really delighted to see is that the president passed prompt pay in 15 days because so many times women would say, I want to get the work, but once I get the work, I can't afford the EBITDA, the cash flow. And so with the 15 pay program, we're now able to get more women into the pipeline. Just last week, we announced a concomitant program called the Supplier Pay Program, where we've now challenged the private sector to match the goals that we have in government. I was pleased to say that already 28 corporations have signed up to follow the government lead. And what what do you, so do you think it's just getting the right people in these positions who are knowledgeable that we need to meet this goal? I think it's the counseling so that women know how to navigate through the labyrinth of government. I think it is the access to capital and that's why we have zeroed out fees for loans under 150,000 through the Community Advantage Program. It's why we put in the total score program that allows us for loans under 350,000 to expedite <coughs> and streamline the process for which to get capital. And I think it's, again, getting the word out about uh, contracting opportunities. I'm delighted to see Barbara Corcoran here because I think she can help brand and expand the knowledge and awareness about these opportunities. So many women don't have a rich uncle that can open the door. SBA has got to be their Uncle Sam that's going to open that door. Mm -hmm. And so, so and tell me about your view on why those micro loans at 50000 are so important. I'm almost asking you now to put your banker hat back on for a second. Do you have a viewpoint about why this, uh, both the intermediate and the 500000 is such a critical thing to women businesses? Um, when you're starting a business, you just want to begin to build your plan, to hire up your core team. Even when I started my own bank, you know, I didn't need the $50 million at, on day one. I needed to get there incrementally. And so just to begin to seed your plan and get your materials together, you need that first small loan. And large institutions, I can share with you as a banker, when I would give my lenders a goal of, say, $15 million a year, their, their interest was in putting out three $5 million loans. When I said to them, you're going to get to the $15 million by 50,000 increments, they were loath to do it because of the underwriting, the technical assistance, the, um, uh, the servicing of the loan. It takes just as much effort to do a $50,000 loan. And in some instances, the paperwork isn't as dependable, as reliable as audited financials of a larger institution. So for asset quality reasons and others, Banks are reluctant. That's why I think the technical, smart systems that we're putting in place will be more effective. Um, and so women want that initial seed capital to just begin, and they want it at competitive rates. And that's why with SBA, so that's one point. Another point is that the reason we're having so much success that now the microloans, 40% of our loans are going to women. So already we see the trajectory, the upstream in that program. And it's because we have technical assistance in those programs. 
we need to make certain that our counseling centers continue to provide technical assistance all the ladder up of the credit pipeline. Thank you. I just Thank wanted you, to say, important. Chairwoman, I know you're about to uh, turn my mic off. I just wanted to say that I am heartened by your leadership. You know, I know that you and I began at the same time. And so I, although I've completed my 100th day, I know that you have too. And it has been just, uh, you know, an incredible process and, and journey to have worked with you and your leadership and that you're holding this hearing to serve half of America's workforce. Remember Warren Buffett said that the reason he's so successful is he's only had to compete with half of America's intellect. And so, um, so you are leveling the playing, playing field and all of the committee is for women. Thank you for that ardent leadership. Thank you, thank you so much. So we'll, thank, we'll let the administrator go on to advocate uh, in all of those <laughs> places and we'll call up our second panel. We're so excited to have uh, Barbara Corcoran with us today who turned a $1,000 loan into $66 million real estate business and now is investing in startups. She'll be joined by Lori Meter, a senior loan officer with Northern Initiatives in Michigan and is involved with both the SBA program as well as intermediate, intermediate lending programs. And she'll be able to speak to the importance of SBA's microloan programs in providing capital to women and how important it is this intermediate step and they'll be joined by Veronica Inspiregreen in Was from Washington, D.C., who will speak about the SBA microloan program and her uh, ability to acquire capital for small businesses from traditional institutions um, who would not provide the small business loan. So all of these witnesses, we're so glad to have you here. And um, we're going to start with you, Barbara. Thank you very much for uh, being here. And we so appreciate your testimony. And uh, can I just yes, of course. Can someone follow up on this issue that you so eloquently pointed out? The men don't relate to products; women pitch. Mm -hmm. Did someone follow no, up on that no. question? Could if I could just get your what do you think needs to happen on that? Is it get women in front of women who understand those products? Is that the is that the solution? Well, obviously, if a woman is pitching a product that women buy and understand, not a golf club necessarily, but a baby carriage or a, um, a household product, a cleaning product, whatever it is, um, if you have women judging it, you're going to get uh, more enthusiasm, just in the same way that Lori Grenier and I on Shark Tank wholeheartedly get what women are talking about. So that's an asset. But the reality is, is that in the angel investment world, in the venture capital world, it is 92% male. And so how are you gonna change that overnight? You know, there are female, um, entirely female angel groups out there that only fund and listen to female-owned businesses. That's a start. But I think, um, it's a long, it's a, it's a long road, and women do need that advantage somehow, somehow, in there, you know. Great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. A Thank pleasure, you. and I appreciate. Thank it. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, um, we'll follow up with uh, questions for uh, Lori and, and uh, Veronica. Thank you. And just uh, we're going to go to the second panel, but I wanted to ask about um, crowdsourcing. I don't know if either of you addressed it in your testimony, but. We had a hearing, field hearing, out in our state, and we saw women entrepreneurs who the microloan issue we want to further promote, and obviously the Internet is a way in which we can further educate people on those opportunities. But I've seen women who are just jumping right into uh, small business. Women said, well, you know, we were going to create an organic cranberry business because we grow cranberries. Nobody had an organic cranberry juice product in the market, and so she just went online and crowdsourced for the the crusher, the presser that was going to make the juice. So, what what role do you think that plays in, you know, communicate the internet communicating and crowdsourcing in general? I mean, I think for women who have product based uh, companies, I think that it's a great way to to get started, get the product out there. Um, however, I think that we have to remember there's many of us that are on the professional services side and it's not it's not quite uh, easy for us to get that level of funding that way um, and I think that particularly in the STEM fields what we're seeing is that a lot of women engineers are leaving the engineering large engineering companies and starting their own business and mainly because um, particularly with the engineering field you know, you've got to climb the corporate ladder and still get to the glass ceiling. And so a lot of women are saying, you know what, I'll just build my own building. And I think that we're seeing that more and more. And I don't know that crowdsourcing would work in that type of an industry. Thank you. 
Lori? Um, we, we have um, actually kind of partnered on a couple different um, projects with crowdsourcing. And, and one of the things it does, especially if it's a consumer-based product, it's a great test market. Right? I mean, really, they're, they're going to find out quickly if there's a, a real interest. So um, an example, we helped uh, a, a new business uh, financing tooling to get their product uh, prototyped. Then they went to the crowdsourcing and were able to then kind of take it to the next level to then begin, um, you know, more mass production of it. Um, would be an example. I've got another one now. It's a 100-plus-year-old theater in a little town in northern Michigan that really needs that theater, been in the same family forever, uh, nephew, great-grandson great of, the, of the original owner, crowdsourced $100,000 um, to fix some of the building. We're going to come in and help him with re-roofing and seating it. So he needed the digital the digitization. So I think there's ways we can, you know, kind of work together on that. And I think it's a really cool thing. Great. Great. Well, thank you both very much for your testimony today. And uh, we'll leave the record open so that people, members who weren't here can um, ask questions and hopefully you can get us answers. But thank you so much for your testimony. We're now going to uh, go to our next panel, which is going to be led by um, Nelly Galan, who is the first Latino president of Television Network who built her own media production company. She now invests in the success of young Latinas. Mm -hmm. uh, she'll be joined by Victoria Wirthberg, the Washington Center for Business, Women in Business from Lacey, Washington. We thank her for being here. She's going to talk about the importance to targeted business development services for women to address unique challenges women face in starting businesses. And Susan Sylvester of Absolute Resource Associates in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, and Lynn Sutton, who is with Advantage Building Contractors from Atlanta, Georgia, who will testify on women's small businesses and the challenges they face when competing for federal contracts. So welcome all of you. We're so appreciative that you are here. And um, so am I, is it not? Nellie Galan, you said Nelly it correctly. Galan. Okay, all right, great. Well, Nellie, you're you so up much. first. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And I'm actually going to start with you because one of the things I want to drill down on is why the sole source contracting matters so much. So you talked about it as it related to the, I think it was the 8A program. Is that what, where you were? Yes. From? So could you just unpack this issue a little bit? <laughs> uh, why does it matter so much? What are the barriers that are stopping us? Well, I can speak from my own experience to say how it made a difference with our, with our company. When we entered into the federal arena, um, we couldn't get any federal government work at all. Our first federal government contract was a project that was sole source to us. It happened to be a $1.5 million project with the CDC to replace their roof. At that time, all we did was roofing. We did such a great job, they said, can you do this? Can you do that? So. It gave us the other the opportunity to get more jobs. Before we completed our first job, they have already assigned other jobs to us. We were able to negotiate a loading dock. It was our first time taking on that type of job. We did an interior build out. We did another roof. They were happy with the performance, needed some other work, and they gave us a chance. We wouldn't have had that. Um, you have to have past performance or you're not going to get the work. Everyone wants to do business with someone that they know. You have to have the past performance as well to be able to show them that the government is spending their money where they need to spend it. So we were given that opportunity the first time around. So, but if basically you're looking at the federal government who is uh, basically doing sole source contract work, and obviously that is an incentive for someone, is what, is what you're saying? I mean, you were competing in other areas where there weren't sole source contracts? Yes, we're always competing. Even today, we spend about 120 hours a week just with putting you know, bids together for what we're doing on the competitive side. But when it comes to the sole source work, we were given that opportunity. Um, if we weren't given that opportunity as sole source, we wouldn't have gotten the job to get started. It's just about getting the first step. Once you're able to show that you can perform, then the, other, then the other agencies will have faith that you can do the job. You bid on the work, you 
you do good work, you'll get more work, but you have to get it. And sole source authority gives us the opportunity to do that. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Uh, in my experience, the sole source work is, uh, it's very difficult to get. You have to find that opportunity before it gets out to the federal biz ops and general public. So you've got to be almost two years before they want to spend that money. You've got to be developing a relationship with that office. You've got to be contacting them you know, sometimes once a week just to stay in touch, try and get those visits with them so you can demonstrate your capabilities and what your performance is. And then keep, they'll keep you in mind when an opportunity comes along that they feel is a good fit for what you have demonstrated your capabilities are. And just as Lynn said, you need experience you know, for federal work. Everybody wants you to have some experience. Um, so to think that we are just sitting there waiting for a sole source to come in our way, it's not the way that it works. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of effort. It's almost easier to work uh, to bid on competitive work because you just wait for the solicitation to come out and you bid on it. And this work, we're doing groundwork two years sometimes ahead of time before that sole source and talking to that contracting officer and convincing them that we are the best value for that project. It's my experience. Okay. Anybody else want to answer on that? Did you have something else, Lynn, you wanted to add? I would like to add to that. Um, one important factor is that to begin with, People are comfortable with, people want to do business with people that they know and that they know that you can do a good job. When uh, Susan was talking about the work that goes into it, for us, it starts with um, investigating on, on the FPDS, finding out what agencies, a lot of work goes into knowing what agencies are sole sourcing work, who is, who is friendly to 8A so that we can get it, who are the decision makers, establishing a relationship, doing the capabilities briefings. It takes at least 18 months before you really get your foot in the door. So the sole source of relationships that I have now started in 2010. When they have a particular situation because of time constraints or um, mission critical situations, they reach out to us directly and they say, here's a statement of work. We have to negotiate that statement of work with them that can also take two months just in negotiating the work. The government saves money because of they're not putting the RFP out and going through that process. The, they're getting fair and reasonable pricing from us because we've negotiated it and we're also able through that negotiation to give them options that actually save them money that might deviate from their statement of work that comes out to solving their problem and we just have a different way and a more cost effective way of doing it. So they benefit in many ways by uh, sole sourcing this to us as well. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Senator Sheehan? Well, I wanted to follow up on the difference. You know, one of the changes that we're talking about from the report is just making sure we really focus on the adequate particular training to women. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, Victoria, you're here representing the Women Business Centers, but I want to talk about what are the differences, because I can already hear some of the debate that we're going to have about, well, why can't SCORE just do this, and why can't, you know, some of the small business centers just do this, so can somebody talk about the differences between the services or what do you think are the critical relevant services that women businesses need? Well, I think for starters, I, I'll speak for Latinas. I think we take for granted that Latinas really don't know yet the system, don't even know how to find out what is offered. Um, it is very complicated. <laughs> if you go on the websites to even go there and start from scratch, it's very difficult. And so from my point of view, I feel like one of the things I hear them say is, we also need to figure out how to learn to partner with other women. We need to build bridges between women that are already further along and create mentorship programs to bring these women through the system and through what is offered, because it's very complicated. Anybody else want to talk about that, particularly about SCORE or the Small Business Development Centers and the difference between what the women's centers are doing? I'd love to. You know, when you, when you start a business, what you're trying to do is get a product market match. So what you're doing is you're understanding the unique needs of your customer segment, and you're designing a product that meets those unique needs. That's what women's business centers have done. They understand what women entrepreneurs need to be successful. 
and we make sure that in all of our centers we offer those services. So for example, mentoring is a major part of most women's business centers. That is not true for the other two programs you mentioned, for women in that we have specialized programs specifically to hook women up with other women in a mentorship capacity. We also understand the unique training needs of women entrepreneurs, and there are some unique training needs, particularly in the areas of finance and understanding financial statements and how to make strategic decisions. And we found that it's really important to cater to the specific interests of women entrepreneurs and where they stand in their confidence gap. Because most women entrepreneurs can be highly successful if given the support they need. And so our training is specifically designed for our target group. But we do partner with the other programs constantly. We do co-counseling. But they send to us their women entrepreneurs who need the ongoing business advice, the meet every week to talk to the business advisor that we are qualified and capable of doing. And so since we're housed with SCORE and SBDC, we see the differences every day in the programs and how the three are, are working together to help women be successful. I hope that answered the question. Well, it's interesting that you're saying that uh, SCORE is sending people to you. Yes. Okay, very interesting. All the time, yes. So, which would just point that then obviously SCORE isn't the solution. Because if they're sending people to you, they're not the solution. One of the... And, but, but you're saying, I just if I could make sure I got this, because Barbara Corcoran said earlier, men don't necessarily relate to the products women are pitching. So if they don't relate to it, why are they going to fund it? But you're saying that they might not relate to the mentoring either, that there's an amount of mentoring that needs to go on and that your product that you're offering with the Women Business Center is more tailored to what the types of mentoring that are successful with women. That's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And we are always being pulled into SBDC counseling for special issues that our women clients face. And it's, um, it's absolutely a testimony to how our program is different that in one building, we're always being called in to help those women clients. Even as SBDC has a woman client, they always have us co-counsel. And can you categorize what that is? Is it again about product? Is it about? Sometimes it's about lifestyle issues. A lot of women have lifestyle issues that they have to deal with in addition to running their company. Sometimes it's about understanding financial statements and being able to ensure that the woman is able to to apply what she learns. Sometimes it's simply that women relate well to other women counselors. We have found that women business advisors tend to help other women feel safer in opening up to say, we don't know, we need help, can you, can you guide us? And sometimes in our situation, we have strong marketing backgrounds, so we're asked to come in to counsel even on those male clients sometimes. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Anybody else want to talk about that, about SCORE and its relationship to the women business centers? Nellie, no? Okay, well, I think that's all. The, oh, Jean, do you have another question? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you. And that's a, that's a great place to end. And I want to make sure I thank Senator Shaheen because she's been a real leader on this issue. And her laser focus on small business in general has been so helpful to the committee, but particularly on this sole source issue, so we thank you. We are going to put uh, legislation together, and your testimony has been very helpful on that front. We've heard you loud and clear that you need more access and that particularly uh, the training that you could do much more. Now, I mean, I'm going to ask you to go away with an assignment of helping us. I think you know some of the things that people have been talking about uh, hearing your testimony uh, we may be, um, let's just say, under, uh, you know, targeting the amount we need. I'd really like to know from you what amount for the women business centers and for the microloan program, not not the the package at 50 and 250, but the amount of money uh, that really could go into this program and, and return benefits to our U.S. economy. Uh, I think upgrading it a little bit is is interesting, but we're here to ask women all across America to help grow our economy. 
That's why we're having this hearing. And you're coming to tell us, here are the challenges that we face as we try to grow the economy. So let's put a real number to it based on these uh, experts who are here, who've been working in the field. Give us a number that you think really represents that micro lending that we should be doing. I've said many times as the chair of this committee, I think small is the new big. By that I mean, the structure of an information economy is about people who can be very expert at their given field. And the more that we empower that, the more they can innovate. And the more we innovate, the more jobs we grow in our economy. So we want to empower small businesses all across the United States. And certainly, we want women to be able to have access to those resources. We want you to be able to design products. And as two female senators, I can tell you this, we definitely want more products designed and delivered for women. And we know. <laughs> We, we know that if women businesses are empowered to do so, they will design those products. And so, uh, again, we want to thank all our witnesses today and everybody who helped participate in this great forum. Uh, it is so heartening to see so many people here and realize that you will help us lead the charge on this issue. We do expect to have legislation on all these fronts, sole source contracting, empowering women through these micro loan increases and in, in intermediate loans also. Uh, the training programs and making sure that the access to capital is there. So thank you all very, very much for a very uh, moving afternoon. And let's, what do you call it? Adelante. Uh -huh. Yeah, we're adjourned. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>